Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. I know some of you are zooming in from the middle of your nights. Very nice to have you all here for this necessary conversation with Jerry White. Um, we'll do a brief introduction um, in just a minute. And I think people will be joining us over the next couple of minutes, but um, I'll also be pasting some information into the chat. So look for that. You might see it a couple of times. Um, but again, we're so happy to see you here. We hope you're all well, keeping safe. Um, Michael, would you like to do a brief introduction of EMA, the International Humanistic Management Association, as we're getting started? Sure, well, thank you. Uh, and welcome everyone uh, to a session hosted by the International Humanistic Management Association. Just very briefly, the association is focused on shifting the paradigm with which we manage organize and we use management as capital M management uh, really for all the things that we organize is pretty much our life and our relationships beyond within business but also beyond business so in this context I'm very excited to hear from Jerry White today uh, the two pillars that we're focusing on are really the protection of dignity as intrinsic value and the promotion of, we uh, of well-being as the outcome variable so uh, that in itself is very simple, but also very radical. And so you see that this is uh, one of the conversations that can help us get at that. So thank you very much, Jerry, for joining. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Erica, for hosting. Great. Um, again, warm welcome. Um, some housekeeping notes. We are recording um, and this recording will be available. Uh, we can share this with you in coming weeks as well. Um, we would invite you to put any comments or questions into the chat, and then we can moderate Q&A or discussion from the chat as we go. I know Jerry would like this to be very interactive, so um, traditionally we save Q&A for the end, but there may be opportunities to, um, to engage uh, as we go along. Um, but certainly please input your comments, questions, remarks, resources you might like to share um, into the chat, and we can moderate from there. Um, Today's Necessary Conversation is sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell. And it's hosted by the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. We're absolutely delighted to have Jerry White here with us today um, to speak about resilience and survivorship in crisis, uh, even the role of values. Jerry, who will join in just one second from his Zoom screen, uh, is an award-winning teacher, activist, humanitarian, and transformative leader known for conducting high-impact campaigns, three of which led to major international treaties, the Landmine Ban Treaty, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Cluster Munitions Ban. He shares in the 1997 Nobel Prize for Peace awarded to the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. He's a senior Ashoka Fellow, and served under President Obama as U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State to launch the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. He's a professor of practice in religion and political science at the University of Virginia. At Fordham, Jerry advises the Gabelli School of Business on how values-based leadership, entrepreneurship, and personal development can be fused to enhance teaching outcomes and empower a rising generation of change makers. Jerry's from Massachusetts. He stepped on a landmine while hiking in Israel when he was 20. He's interviewed thousands of trauma and crisis survivors worldwide, and he wrote a book to share his own and collected insights on survivorship in getting up when life knocks you down. Again, we're so pleased and honored to have you with us today, Jerry, to share your insights on survivorship survivorship and resilience in crisis welcome thank you so much erica and, and thank you all for zooming in to have a chat about resilience so it's both um you know a heavy topic but also hopefully a helpful one that we can just uh, get into a discussion about how we all are finding resilience in a in a tough time so um as you heard i'm originally from massachusetts today um, or now i live in saint augustine florida which is, for many of you who may not know, is the oldest city in America. But city is an exaggeration since it's only about 12,000 people you know, on the northern Floridian coast. 
So it's sunny and beautiful here, and I um, you know, welcome everyone and thank you for taking some time with us. So the word survivorship, I'm not even sure if it's in the dictionary, but it is about how do we live dynamically and positively um, in the face of disease or disaster, destruction, death, disability. You know, these are all the D, the dreaded D words. So it's a question like all around the world, whether conflict or peacetime or you know, people dealing with all sorts of challenges, how do you do that positively? So how do you live dynamically? Um, and I came to this as, as you heard sort of early on, I had a pretty nice upbringing. I mean, there were bumps along the way, but it really was when I was 20 years old, I had this before and after moment. You know, here I was a Irish Catholic boy from Boston. I went to Brown University. I became the first um, non-Jew to graduate with a degree in Judaic studies, trying to learn about Judaism. There wasn't a lot of di diversity in my small hometown. So I ended up like being very curious about the first the Abrahamic faiths, you know, Islam and Judaism and Christianity, and then moving on to variations and then Buddhism and uh, Islam and others that I have integrated over the years to like in my travels to like learn as much as I can on in the quest or seeking of truth, which I think we all ask ourselves deep questions um, at different parts of our lives. So survivorship is a challenge. Like, how do we do that? Well, it turns out that as I was traveling around the world or, you know, after myself and stepping on a landmine, years later, I started to help war victims in, you know, probably 60 different countries, mostly landmine victims and amputees, but really almost any type of conflict survivor, genocide survivor, et cetera. And we kept interviewing them and trying to think, what's the recipe for resilience? How do people facing the worst that like, you know, humanity or the world could offer you, um, the most painful, desperate poly trauma, multiple traumas, how do some people keep smiling? You know, or why is it that some really are taken out and we don't judge or blame them that they're taken out by these traumas and uh, they sort of slip into victimhood? Another word of like, what does that mean when you just sort of get stuck in the awful thing and you can't seem to pull yourself out of it? So this question became real. Like, what is the recipe for resilience? How do you recover and live positively and do more than just survive? How do you move from a victim status to a survivor status to maybe a flourishing or thriving status? And I know some of these words may sound glib, and I apologize for that because in the face of trauma, there's, you shouldn't be glib. You know, it's, it's, it's more about listening. And that's what we'd like to hear from some of you. So, uh, but I learned from all these survivors around the world, these sort of five steps. I'm going to name them up front and then we'll start with the first step and then we'll sort of open that up to conversation and then we'll move through. So Q and A or comments in the chat room are welcome as we go through the steps. And, and I ask you to reflect on your current situation. So the, um, the five steps of the recipe for resilience are basically number one, face facts. Number two, choose life. Number three, reach out. Four, get moving. And five, give back. So those are the five we're going to touch on. There's also a secret one, six, that I'll let you know after we cover the five because it came to me later after I had done my research and wrote the book as well. So the first is, what is like survival and trauma? Well, I'm defining it as like a before and after moment where something happens in your life, including 2020 will be a before and after year for all of us and for the world. So before and after moment where life is never the same. So that can be all sorts of things. How did I sort of think about that? Well, I was, had the privilege of working with the Princess of Wales. Um, really, it was, I was taking her through Bosnia and introducing her to survivors of landmines. And we were working on the landmine issue very closely in 1997. And we went to go visit survivors, you know, in all different homes and settings. And there's one particularly sad visit of a widow who had lost her husband after the war because he had just gone fishing on a sunny day and ended up wheeling in a landmine that exploded and killed him, leaving this woman and her two young children, aged two and four, you know, without a father and the mother-in-law living in the home. So lots of tears that had just happened. We're having this conversation and we're showing that just because I stepped on a landmine or this, it's not the only thing that gets blown up. The family gets blown up. The economy gets blown up. The livelihood or source of income can be blown up. There's all sorts of things that happen when an explosion or a landmine goes off, like metaphorically in your life or in mine quite physically. 
So when we were back in the minivan driving with the Princess of Wales, she said, you know what, it's so interesting that every survivor you introduce us to tells me their date. I was like, well, yeah, I'm April 12th, 1984. And then Ken Rutherford, my colleague and partner who lost both his legs in Somalia, he says, I'm December 16th, 1993. Again, a date you'll never forget. And then she paused and she said, the princess said, you know what? I think I'm July 29th, 1981. And then she burst out laughing and she goes, because that was the day she married Prince Charles. So here was a woman with like, again, a sign of resilience, which is humor, cackles and laughs, but that was quite sophisticated or had high emotional intelligence to say, oh, that's probably the def best definition or simplest definition of trauma, a before and after moment, a date. And many of us have, I mean, how many in the room, just raise your hand if you have a date where you had a significant loss and life was never quite the same. If you aren't raising your hand, I'd say like, wow, you're lucky, but you know, your date's coming. I mean, you have your birth date and then you have your death date and some things in between. So it's not again, to, but keeping humor, understanding that such is life is really a reality of what we do. So we get to the first step of resilience, which is like facing the facts of life. Um, for me, we found that like, you know, my leg is gone. I'm in a hospital, didn't plan on this in Israel for six months. Um, my leg's not growing back. I'm not a starfish. You know, I joke, my hair's not growing back. You know, we just have to, there are facts in our lives that you have to face that are very difficult. And that's the part we hear about in grieving, how you have to break through denial. Um, sometimes we just will not look, we're blind to the facts because it's too painful. And you, can, and you don't rush people, like it's not my job to make all of you see your facts. It's your honesty with yourself and your situation to examine and, in, and inquire after your facts. And the other piece there is like, what does it mean to face your feelings and your fears? That those are facts as well. So they also are things we can run from, we can try to freeze out, numb out, not look at. We can fight the facts, dispute the facts. Um, so this first step is probably the hardest one. What's true for me in my life and what do I feel about it? I mean, for me, I, I sort of got so busy running around and getting recovering from losing my leg that I actually, as sort of a competitive, fast moving guy, didn't really interrogate my feelings so much. And it was almost like two years later that it really dawned on me the enormity of the loss that my leg was really not growing back, that this really wasn't just a dream or a nightmare, that in fact, this was a condition that I had to learn to live with. So we have personal facts, we have work and livelihood, community facts, you know, and we have global facts as well, right? So right now we have a big fact of a pandemic with different people's interpretations of what that will mean as we project the future, but all we have is like right now today. So I guess I'd open up on the first question and, and Erica, by all means guide this if you'd like on the, what's your fact? today or what are your facts and let, I we'd like to invite you to reflect on that for a you know 10 or 15 seconds and if you'd like to share in the chat please go ahead and share one of your facts you want one example for me as you're thinking of your fact like oh, you're on lockdown okay that's a, we share a lot of facts we're supposed to be social distancing we haven't seen maybe many of our loved ones you know my case it'd be like the biggest fact of COVID for me is trying to think about my mother in an assisted living facility where there's COVID, where one of my best friend's fathers just died from COVID and he couldn't even go see his mother, touch his mother, even tell, I mean, touch his father and then tell the mother who had been married for 65 years that, you know, in person that her husband was dead. So these are, there's something about the facts of COVID that are quite deeply personal for each of us. Um, yeah, so I'm not complaining about my lockdown. I'm complaining about like, but what if I can't? My mother says she doesn't want to die there or die alone. So those are facts that my whole family is like scrambling to figure out. Therefore, what do we do? And everyone has a different fact in their household. So what's an idea or thought from your, you know, even if two people unmute themselves, um, is there a fact of your current COVID life that you're struggling with most? I'm actually seeing some nice facts come through the chat as well. 
Jim Ritchie Dunham, do you want to share? You're unmuted. A lot of serious facts. These and they don't all begin with C. It's not obviously not just COVID. The rest of life didn't stop just because COVID showed up. So I think more of these facts will be coming in. I'm curious, how do you move from facing facts to your next step? And your next step is choose life. So step number two, choose life. Is that after you've you know, almost been depressed by your facts and felt your feelings around the facts, you think like, well, does my life have to be defined by this bad year or this awful date, April 12th, or losing my leg? Is that who I am? So the research suggests around like the world like a, um, on resilience that those who actually have faith or spirituality or make meaning beyond their body have, a, a, let's say, a competitive advantage in survivorship. So there's this aspect of choose life that implies hope, you know, that my life won't always be this painful you know, one day at a time. Today is painful, but tomorrow doesn't, won't be the same. It might be painful, might be less, might be different. You know, wait for it, it will change. So choosing life is also thinking, I'll give an example. One of my colleagues and friends from El Salvador, Jesus Martinez, was uh, I think like 17 years old. And it was during the war, civil wars in El Salvador. He's walking along a pathway. He steps on a landmine, big explosion, loses both of his legs there then the spot as a, as a teenager. And he's so horrified and knows that he do, doesn't want to live without legs that he goes and reaches and finds another landmine in the grass near him and picks it up and starts to smash it against his chest. He wanted to die. So that's really like choose life or death. There are choices. He wanted to die. He didn't want to face limb loss, you know, and life in El Salvador, a developing country with knowing the discrimination and the pain he, he was in for. But then he goes into the hospital. He actually begs a soldier walking by, please shoot me. He tries another thing, like the landmine doesn't work. The soldier won't shoot him. So he ends up in a hospital. And while he's in his hospital bed and rather depressed, still thinking about ways to take his life, he hears laughter outside his window. And he sort of goes over and he looks out the window and he sees like three guys in wheelchairs playing wheelchair basketball. He'd never seen such a thing. And that was his aha moment. And just like in a moment, he chose life. Like, I want that. It's different for everyone. Like almost like that, that, that breath one takes and says, you know what, I can do this and I want this and I hope for this. So choosing life is a, you know, you know question of you know, quality of life over the pain and sometimes the quantity of life. So he then went on to become like one of the most significant disability rights leaders, not only on the land and mine campaign for us, but for our human rights in El Salvador. So we're also grateful that now that he's, you know, in his 40s and a father and married and has become a leader, that like Jesus Martinez didn't, you know, or didn't succeed at choosing death during that time. But these are things we make the choices every day, every year, but really to remember that this bad day, this awful moment, this terrible thing doesn't have to and really doesn't define who you are as a person. I mean, I joke lastly on the choose life is this mystery of you've heard of phantom pain and, and uh, when you lose a limb, you can still feel it. Phantom. So at first it's very painful. It's like someone can feel like they're taking a ice pick and shoving it up your foot that you don't even have. And I'll be like, ow. And then it goes away as fast as it comes. So a phantom pain attack happens quite often to most amputees early on, you know, near their accident or their limb loss. And then over time, it sort of happens more periodically or seasonally. Like when the weather is changing, I'm more likely to have a phantom pain attack that might last for a few hours. Um, but the secret, so that sounds awful, doesn't it? You're like, but the other thing is I have phantom pain sensation. And I can also feel and draw my attention to the foot I don't have. And I feel my toes and I feel my heel that I don't have. And I can feel my ankle 
And actually the foot that I don't have is more alive than the foot I do have in feeling. It has more energy, it's more interesting. The one I am overusing every day is sort of tired and numb. So what is that? So I think that this idea of having, so then I think, oh, I, I know what it's like to be an energy source or like just even fanciful choose. I, I know what it's like to be an angel because I lost my limb. I can feel the shape of my body while not having the physical body. And that's just something I like to think about. Who knows how scientific it is? Who knows who believes in angels? But that's one little way I choose life is making a story and meaning out of my missing foot and say, I like my missing foot more than I like my real foot. So there are some interesting comments that are coming in and I'll, I'll just um, add to this a little. There's one person who just said, does choosing life always come as an aha moment or can it come gradually? And I'm actually, I'd love for you to answer that, but I'm also struck by the comment you made when we spoke the other day that in your case, there was a very memorable moment of a nurse and a wheelchair that helped facilitate your choice. And maybe you'd like to talk about that too. So let me save that one for the fourth step because I think it's interesting what she said is it is a little bit about choosing life and getting on, but and it's it's related to this question of gradually. Right. I think those people, particularly when you're struggling with depression and you realize I just have to do, I have to get up in the morning or I have to, um, and then I'm just going to go swimming. Or let's say you have the luxury to do that. And then you're like, you do laps every day and you hate it. And you're forcing yourself to do it because you're going through the motions of life despite the pain. And then you sort of gradually wake up and realize like, no, I've been swimming a lot or I'm in better shape or the pain is less or um, it took that long for something to dawn or for life to you know, rise again. So yes, it's not always an aha moment. For some it is, sometimes it's like a month, sometimes it's a few years, sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back into victimhood and then you like leave. So this is not a linear path. There's no one answer for this, but it means, oh, choosing life is a possibility and hope does matter. So I think that's the, the bigger message of, second, of the second step. Great. And your third step. So how do we transition now to reach out? And for everybody on the Zoom today, I did just now post um, a deck that summarizes the five steps of survivorship. So that is in the chat for you. But the next step three is reach out. Can you tell us about that? So then we learn from the literature, trauma research, but also the many survivor friends around the world. Um, and you will know that you don't survive alone. Isolation you know, can be tempting. And we're all like right now, we're like, oof, we feel more isolation than ever. So isolation actually will kill you. Like we are meaning seeking creatures and social beings. So we need touch. We need contact with other people. So, um, but when you're in a lot of pain and you don't want people to see how you're reacting, including you want to withdraw like a turtle, I call it turtle dumb. You're like, ouch, pull into the shell. No one really has to know that I'm not handling this well. So, but that's the exact time where you need to reach out. Others need to be reaching out to you and you all, we all need to be reaching out to those who are maybe in bigger trouble or the same trouble as us. And so, you know, we have this modern thing called Zoom we're doing, we're reaching out and connecting. So there are substitutes where you can, you know, continue the social connection even when not ideal or if you're on lockdown or isolation or quarantine or even in you know, prison. So there are ways of reaching out. So the example for me was when I was in the hospital, a guy walked in my room. He, uh, I, was, I was in a room with four other um, guys my age who had been soldiers who had lost their limbs and their eyes and their arms in the war in Lebanon at the time, the Civil War. And so there I was, um, and this guy comes in and he says, what's your name? I say, Jerry, I can't remember his name. And he says, um, I also stepped on a landmine and I lost my leg, can you tell which one? And he walked back and forth in front of my hospital bed and he was wearing blue jeans and I literally, I couldn't tell, like he walked rather smoothly and well. And he goes, that's my point, your problem is not down there. You know, your problem is here and here. Like that's the challenge, how are you thinking about this? And then he asked me, do I still have my knee? Yes, that's good, playing tennis, being active, like it's a nice joint to have being an above the knee amputee, amputee is tougher than being a below the knee. He goes, can you still have children? Because of the nature of landmine explosions, and you know, so I have four children, so I think it still works. So anyway, he says, what you have is a nose cold. You'll get over it. And he left my room and I was just sort of like, 
you know, sort of tough Israeli love. But that was a piece of peer support I learned that he came in and he basically, you know, I never met him again. And I thought to myself, if he can, if that jerk can do it, even though he wasn't that jerk, so can I. And it reframed, talk about an aha moment of peer support, someone going through something. And I thought, oh, I will be able to walk that smoothly if I want. And I can think about, what if I turn this around and said, this is a nose cold. This, even though it's a, and so reframing the conversation was a result of someone reaching out to me. And later on in the hospital, when I was feeling sorry for myself and more victimy, and I was like two, you know, the fifth month in, I'm wheeling around in my wheelchair and um, I go to the social worker and she says, oh, I see we're feeling sorry for ourselves today. And I didn't know that back home, she had, you know, a guy, her husband had a spinal cord injury from a war. She didn't, she shared that with me. And then she goes, well, why don't you go visit the burn center? I was like, ouch. Or better yet, there's this one guy, soldier, he was an officer, he won't talk to anyone, he's isolated in his room, so why don't you go teach him English? And so I wheeled down, I got to know this guy who was um, yeah, isolated and he wanted to die. And so because I was only five months into losing my leg, but this guy was like two months in and also had lost his sight temporarily and might lose his second leg, I formed a relationship. I did what was done to me. I started to visit. I started to make fun of him. We started to eat lunch together. I taught him some English. It's a lifelong friendship. I'm still in touch with him and his family. He went on to be a top lawyer in Israel, you know, with three thriving kids and a wonderful marriage. So those are the things that reaching out happens, you know, in social ways, but we need connection. So I guess the question comes back to you all. Who's reaching out to you that matters? Who, you, who, you, who do you wish would be reaching out to you in this tough time? But also it's on you. Who are you reaching out to? So isolation and, you know, loneliness and withdrawing and saying, well, no one even probably knows what my situation is. Or I can't complain because it's the year of COVID. But yeah, you, that's what friends are for, right? You get to kvetch and complain a bit. So think of yourself in your list today. Maybe write it down or say like, oh, who have you called? Who have you texted? Who have you Zoomed? And who are you secretly waiting to Zoom you? And why don't you just do it? You reach out. Get ahead out of the reach out curve. Step number three. Great. And what's step four? So step four is get moving. So that's the, the thing you're referencing. When I first got out of a hospital bed in Israel and I'm, you know, exhausted, I've lost a lot of weight. We're done with the transfusions. It's now time to learn how to use a wheelchair. And there's a cafeteria in the hospital where you have to go down and get your lunch. It was no longer breakfast in bed. So I, after a lot of struggle, get into the wheelchair and there's the nurse looking at me and I'm looking up at her and she says, if you want to move, then push. Like there was going to be no coddling in an Israeli hospital. I was like, Ugh, I'm tired. I'm in pain. You're a beautiful nurse. Push me to lunch. I guess I'm like, a, you know, spoiled, they say mefunak. So he's like, she's like, no. So again, whatever you can do, getting out of bed, taking a shower, wheeling yourself down to get like a hard boiled egg, like none of this is pretty. Get moving. That means I can't do it for you. I can't do your rehab. I can't get you out of bed. I can't change anything about you. It's on you. Like the universe gave me this thing and you were given another set of things for you to move on and move into and move forward. So that's another thing. Um, yeah, it's tough. Sometimes I get calls for discipline, but it also calls one day at a time to say, oh, I have a choice of life to go see someone down the hallway and therefore I must get in a wheelchair and wheel myself down and knock on their door. Like it's, get moving, just even in isolation, I'm most worried as we are about ourselves, you're fit. My mother's at 85, she used to swim like six days a week. She's not swimming. You know, she can't move out of her apartment. Like she's atrophying. So the, and, and without COVID. So the isolation is indeed killing her. Um, yeah, get moving. What are you doing to move? It is a discipline and it is also can be simple. Today, I'm like making a mask. Like today I shaved. 
I shaved for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually interested in this idea of this cadence of moving, of getting moving, that maybe it's not always consistent. Yeah, I mean, now I'm thinking about it every day. Like, like I joke with my wife on lockdown here in Florida. It's just like, I don't know, can we, can we have lunch? It's 1030. Can we have lunch? <laughs> Some things are like, everything's like starting earlier. Or you're like, time is bizarre. And which day is like another? Like two days ago was our 31st anniversary. Did it feel like a different day than every other day? Like, oh, ooh, you want to do like takeout today? Like, that's like the big excitement. Like, so I think it is, it's, it's so individual for all of us. That's what we come to again and again. I have my stories just to highlight that you have your own stories and that the world has billions of stories. So there's a cadence that is different every day. And how about step five? Then step five, we found, you know, in big and small ways, it's the givers that survive most, give back. So this becomes the secret sauce to resilience, that if the studies show that too, that we're wired for altruism, or like we're wired for like food, you know, sex, sleep, and giving. That's where your serotonin or dopamine is, where like your chemicals go up when you're a giver. And it's counterintuitive because if everything feels like it was taken away from you in your trauma or your limbs, you're not in the mood, you're not in a giving you know, surplus mode. But still, what we looked at all the sad and stories, crazy stories around the world, we'd say that guy is missing his arms and his legs, his house was burnt down, he saw his daughter killed in front of, shot in front of him, or like, like the war stories which are beyond speakable. And you ask, why is he smiling? And you're like, there'll be something like, well, he has this one like tomato patch that he tends every day. And then he brings most of his tomatoes down to like another family or a local orphanage. Like he gives away his tomatoes. He's happy. So again, you know, four limbs do not a body of life make. You know, even as Nelson Mandela said, like four walls do not a prison make. Like what's happening in here and here is a lot of it. And then this, again, moving piece, we are alive. See what you can move. Whatever you can move, move. And the giving back, move into action so it's not just about you. So in service to the whole, to others, to anyone, me doing peer support to others. And later on, we created a network of survivors helping survivors around the world. And you saw that the peer support workers and the amputees and the social workers who were actually in the giving, their health quality of life scores were way higher. They had lost much more, but way higher than the administrators or the people who had all their limbs, maybe back at the office, who were not actually giving every day. I mean, they were doing their job, had a meaningful job, but in fact, it was the givers, stupid. They, their, their rates, their scores, um, you know, for like even SF36, it's a, you know, a, a perceived health a measure done in a lot of different languages. And it was like, oh, whether they're living with cancer or living with limb loss, their perceived quality of life and health was much higher than their peers. So the studies all around the world show this. So again, giving in small and big ways. So then the question for you all is, so how are you giving in the time of COVID? There's the reaching out. It's one form of it. What are you giving? Should Not to yourself invite? or your survival, beyond your survival. Should we invite what you're giving in the chat? If anyone would like to add anything that they feel like they're contributing. I mean, think of how many of you probably just like, or in your family, someone picked up, got out a sewing machine. It was just like, damn it, well, I can just do, I'll just make masks. Like that's why they're sort of like moving in action and starting to think about other people. And you're like, oh, they're, they tend to be smiling a little more. And it doesn't mean that it's all about smiling or happiness. It just means relative to others, you'll be better off the extent to which you keep giving in your exercise routine. So any, uh, even when you're on lockdown, what's some creative giving examples from this group? Again, I think we're seeing um, some nice giving 
contributions in the chat. I love that reading to my mother. Yeah. And we have a diverse audience. You know, we're scholars, we're students, uh, we're in the world of business industry um, and, and elsewhere. So I want that homemade wine. Who's giving that? <laughs> Great. So from survivorship, from these five steps of survivorship, and I think this is a nice segue to flourishing. I think that's, so you're, you see the spectrum and it isn't so linear, but like victimhood, the hallmarks, we can sniff it on ourselves where we're like, oh, I'm living in the past, the number one hallmark. Like there was a day pre-COVID or there was a day before my limb loss or I was homecoming king or something like, like where life was better. And that's nostalgia living in the past is a sign of victimhood, even in leaders who just keep bringing up the past. Or there was once, they're still living as if it's 9-11. You know what I mean? Like still living as if that like 1565 siege is in the collective consciousness. So victimhood happens collectively as well, but so living in the past. And then these other things, blaming, projecting, and scapegoating, and feeling sorry for yourself, self-pity. These are all emotions. There's nothing wrong with them except it can become an addiction and sort of a trap that the more you sip on victimhood, blaming, resenting, and taking, it's insatiable. Like no amount of drug, nothing can give my leg back. Even if you just gave me a million dollars, I could still stay a victim. So we know when it comes to addiction, you can over treat something or be codependent, but you also are just trying to help at times, but you have to notice when in, and when in our own lives we're slipping again and those like hallmarks of victimhood are showing up. And then the thing about resilience is it's something you do. You get in shape for, you have a moral compass, you have a social support. All of the, the Yale studies on uh, one of the slides that I think was shared, you know, from uh, Steve Southwick and Dennis Charney, who's now the Dean of the, the medical school in um, Mount Sinai in New York. They say like, yeah, optimism you could debate. Are you sort of born with it or without it? You know, is that the genetic one? Every other hallmark, all the other nine ones, like having a role model, having a, like moral support or peer support, having, you know, making um, training or discipline. These are like, you get in shape for resilience. So you, right now, whatever you're doing during the time of COVID is making you more resilient or less. You're getting in shape. It's like going to the gym, but it's, you know, sort of different and that it's social. So these are things one can work on and build up those muscles for your life when you will need resilience. Because as I said, we will all have dates we've had and dates we will have. And you doesn't, they are dates that don't have to take you back to victimhood and the feeling of death and destruction. So the last thing was, after I had written this book, done a lot of work with survivors, I like was sort of burning out. It, like it was almost like my own daughter every now and then would say, dad, read your own book. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like I'd be kvetching or complaining about something and she'd be like, oh, you sound like a victim, like used my language against me. And I thought, fair. I said, but why do I still just feel tired? Like, why do I have to be resilient? Why does everyone have to be still like, it's your choice. I have no judgment. So then I started to realize that, oh, in life, we have to perform so much. We're doing things for the kids. We're doing things for our classes. We're doing things for our colleagues, for our family. There's so much performance and doing in the world, including staying in shape or being resilient that I was sort of burnt out and said like, I'm just like sort of done here being so resilient. <laughs> so I was like, and then I realized that I had been missing this piece. Like what if you just as calmed down and sat and that breathing was enough. Again, we learned different techniques for meditation. And I remember this board member when I was, you know, said to me like, Jerry, you could just relax. You've done a lot of wonderful things. Like you could, you know, Calm down. Why are you always trying to get to the next summit? You remind me of a donkey with a carrot strapped on it in, in front of it, and the donkey's chasing the carrot. What's that carrot for you? And I didn't really like this idea of myself as a donkey, and, but it was like she put her finger on something I couldn't answer. What is the carrot? What am I chasing? Why do I keep doing? And why is nothing ever enough? I mean, you could psychoanalyze that, but that was, a, so she said, do you have a spiritual discipline? And I said, um, what do you mean? Like that yoga stuff? She was like, calm down. Let's, you know, do you breathe? What do you mean? I don't like, what do you mean? Meditate? 
and calm down. She goes, if you take 60 seconds a day, just sit quietly and breathe for the first month, two minutes a day the second month, three minutes a day the third month, by the end of the year, you'll have what I call a spiritual discipline. She broke it down and made it so easy that I, I'm like, and I'm a competitive guy. So the next morning I'm in a chair, I have my cell phone, I have my coffee, this is probably like 10 years ago. And I sit for my 60 seconds and I put on my timer and I'm like, I reach for my phone. I'm like, oh my God, like that was like 37 seconds. Shoot, that's a start over, press. Oh, the 60 seconds are long. Reach, got a sip of coffee. Couldn't do 60 seconds. Stillness and breathing. That's what I had become. Like a doing addict. Distracting from all of these other things. So because I was, I was like, I, I realized that I was sick. Well, it would be like spiritually obese. I couldn't even do like a sit-up, a spiritual sit-up or push-up. And so then began adding the sixth step to the five that we've talked about. And uh, it is really just like breathe, like being without any doing, just sort of sitting, breathing, centering. You can do, doesn't, technique doesn't, like there's a thousand ways to do it. So I did learn over time, I went, you know, way into like Buddhist, like 10 day silent retreats. Like I was gonna make, you know, breathing my bitch. I mean, it sounds so awful to say, sorry. But I was, because again, I'm such a doer and I was competitive. So I'm like, I'm going to be a great meditator. <laughs> Missing the whole point of like meditation, right? But that was lastly, I would say that showed up early and I never paid attention when I had a young child who must have been no more than like four or five. And I have four children and I liked competing, like playing games with them, doing whatever. And I was one of these awful fathers who would never let one of my kids beat me. They should learn. Like if they're going to be good at a skill, whether tennis or backgammon, like why would I let my child win? So this sounds like usually like... So it was my own daughter, my first child, when I'm playing whatever, and I'm like winning, and she's, she says, be lax, daddy, be lax. And it was like, it was, I was like, oh, she's trying to be cute, so she'll, I'll take my eye off the prize of winning. But she was intuiting, like, here was like an overperforming dad, you know, even making fun, like something one does, as opposed to just enjoy. And so that's the sixth step, is just um, be lax. Like today's enough, my breathing's enough. Of course we have plenty to do, but that's not like, that's not what's missing. And so COVID is actually like having us come face to face. Like what is it when being forced to be lax is like not so much fun, um, but the opportunity to be more lax or breathe and say, I am here and I am alive and I breathe and I love like that's, the sixth step that didn't make a way into the book. And I actually think it's now the most important one. So I'm going to see what you think about this question. So here we are and we're being, and we're doing, and we're doing our best at that. And yet we're sitting at this moment in history where we have an unprecedented opportunity, unprecedented opportunity to change the trajectory of our future, right? For the well being of humanity. So, so what now? And I think this speaks maybe to some of um, the ideas you've been working with around trans and cross-disciplinary work to make these types of changes the world needs. I guess you ask like, so what, as teachers, many of us are already like, that's in a space of giving, which is like, you know, it's age appropriate for me in my late fifties to, take what I've learned, have a teachable point of view and share whatever wisdom I can. And in my sense, I'm still like, I want as many of these young mini transformers that are in my, you know, 60 people in each semester that I get my, my you know, fingerprints on. I love them like I love my own children. And I'm thinking they are the leaders that are inheriting much of this mess. And it's going to be made worse that 4 million graduates just in the US alone, you know, going into the workforce during a time of, you know, significant depression and not like, what do you do? How do you take the hopes and the dreams and the student debt? So this is, it's, it's not just COVID, it's the series of consequences. So that it had me think like, what do I want? What can I do more of or less of? And I think that's a question for all of us. So the students, I try to 
say that if there's an opportunity to create the next generation of leaders and create what I call transpreneurs. So there's entrepreneurs.com, like busy one, you know, they want to go work on like Wall Street or, you know, start a company. There's like the, I would call them intrapreneurs. You work for a big company or the government, like IBM, the government, and you, you have, you still have any creativity within. And then that's the sort of .gov ish. And then there's the .orgs, sort of think of them as like interpreneurs, like the landmine movement, we grew 1200 organizations in over 120 countries to create the mine ban treaty and ban the weapon. So the .orgs, no one NGO is big enough to change the world on its own. It needs, you know, a collective. So interpreneurship, building coalitions, understanding how to create strategies and power. And then the last one, like BLAX, um, I'm teaching the students and I had to be, I felt that I was being unscholarly at UVA. You know, so if I'm saying like, could we just start class like with a minute of silence, settle everyone in? You know, there's more and more studies on contemplation and why this actually gets the mind ready for better learning. So it's actually should just be a norm. And I'm in, like, I'm sort of sheepish, like hard driving people like me, like, do you mind? Like, is it embarrassing if we just sit silent or in the middle of the class, take a break and also like go back inside. So that I would call innerpreneurship. Why was I burning out? You had to be a mini transformer or a transpreneur. You must have whatever it is, some form of inner discipline, spiritual discipline. It could be running marathons. Like I don't, I'm agnostic about, it's not religion. It's breathing back to like, you know, so that's what training the next generation of transpreneurs that are in the .com, .org, .gov, and .edu. And that leaders, hybrid leaders, need to know how to work in each of these spaces. Like if you're moving systems and the world, you actually have to know the four or five different zoos and you have to be egoless enough or like have your ego in check and be centered enough that you can actually co-share, co-leadership, co-creation, collaboration, all the good co-words. So that's my, like my calling now is like, for, it's like how fast, since I'm still like a do how fast can I give aha moments to the you know, scores and scores or hundreds if not thousands of mini transformers or transpreneurs so that they are equipped to bring and usher in the systemic change in leadership that is absolutely needed and overdue for the issues we're facing. Sorry for such a long answer, but here's to transpreneurship. Great. Thank you. And I, I see we have about 10 minutes to go and I see there are some questions and some comments in the chat. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think I saw one from Jim. Jim, do you want to ask your question? Jim Stoner, are you there? I just saw that one fly by. This next gen. How, how, Which one? Which of my two questions? <laughs> well, go, you choose. Go ahead. Yes, <laughs> Jerry, a whole bunch. Uh, one is the Landmark Education Forum play any role in what you're doing? I just came in late. I apologize. I think I also asked, how can we train this next generation so that they're operating right now, not wait till the next generation? Because uh, we don't have a lot of time. And I forgot the other two. I think that's why I usually say rising generation. It means like at any age, I am age agnostic. And they're the wise ones, and then there's elders, and then there's like CEOs, and then so pulling together coalitions that in fact are pretty intergenerational and rising leadership meetings for such a time as this. And yes, it's now to practice and to mentor and to work together on these things. So that's um, one thing. On the landmark piece, it's interesting. So when I was early on being trained by a mentor from India, she says, go and do the landmark forum. Just when she goes, you're going to hate the marketing stuff. You're going to hate like the pressure stuff. She's like, I only go to watch how to work with large groups and move them into an aha moment, which, and I, you know, I must say that. So I did the, whatever the, the session. And I was like, oh, and then I found that fascinating. Oh, a skilled teacher using examples from a group can move the whole group through a series of projections or techniques or whatnot and have a, and sure enough, I wasn't wild with like, you know, it's the pressure cooker of all this stuff or the marketing or, and this is not a time in my mind of transpreneurship where you're branding. So people that are overcharging elites needing to do extra classes in landmark or others, that's like, that's pretty elite. 
And then it's pretty pressure to channel you into more. So it's a business model. Is, so I'm not here to criticize or not criticize. What I'm saying that's different now for me was learning. There's great things to learn from many programs like, you know, Landmark. How do we take that and democratize it and make it available to everyone, including people who are illiterate or will not ever go and sit in a forum or have that luxury? So the question's hitting us is like, can we democratize this? Is what we're doing accessible? Can anyone breathe? Can anyone change the world? I actually believe that we can unleash, like everyone can change the world a few times over in their lifetime with some things we know and how we've done it in the past. Like I didn't expect as like a preppy boy with no background to like be a, a birthing treaties. And I didn't do it alone, but now I was like, oh, I know how I, I feel that I can help produce or co-produce like, you know, you know, systemic change in the world. And it sounds so difficult to be a change maker. Even Ashoka can make it too precious and it's heropreneurship. This is not the time for the individual stars or to brand.orgs. This is a time for co-leadership in the time post COVID. Great, I couldn't agree more, thank you. Um, I saw there was a question by Ellie about the one sort of sustaining thread through all of your steps. I think she's interested in that one piece that kept you going and enabled you ultimately to be the change maker you are in the world. I think it's that like number two and number six, like what runs through it is this consciousness of like I'm breathing, so it's whether the breathing, from whence do you find your wellspring or your breath? Or that idea this, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't really like the word hope or like faith, like that, that we don't find a general acceptable word to say, which is like, what's the river, the stream that runs through this, Jerry? And I would say, because then if I say hope, what about like the people in despair feeling no hope? Like, what good is that step for them? See what I'm saying? So it's a little bit of a trick question, like some consciousness, like, but hope enough to say, choose life, not death this day, which is from the book of Deuteronomy or the Abrahamic, you know, Hebrew text. That's so interesting. This day, you know, one day at a time, one moment at a time, one breath at a time. So it's staying breathing. So you live long enough to see what maybe was intended. The fruit, the sequel to the survivor story is always much more interesting than the train wreck. That's why survivorship is what we're talking about, not survival tales. Shark attack at noon. This is something more wisdom oriented. So I feel that maybe the word it's, and then again, it sounds religious, but I don't think of it as religious mm -hmm. grace. Something unmerited. Like I was, I was kept alive long enough with hope and confidence that I wasn't going to die in that minefield and bleed out and that this would not take me down. So I had a hope and a conviction from where that's mm -hmm. why I, I don't know. What is grace? I said, it's something very teeny. It was a little voice in my head in that minefield that said, you don't die this way. You don't die today. There's a purpose. Who said that? And I know there have been some questions about this idea you've, you've been playing with on transpreneurs um, and this idea of co-leaders or ERSs. Um, so someone's asking about if you have other writings about that. Um, and then what advice would you give to the to the people in our classrooms, to the people you're in contact with, to the next gen change makers or now gen change makers. How do they do that? What skills do they need? I love, um, so transpreneurship, no, I'm sort of writing on it now and it's sort of even working with Fordham and UVA. And so I welcome this. I was like, oh, Jerry Wines wants to, you know, trademark transpreneurship. I'm, I, it's an invitation to say, are you, you know, transcendent and transsector and trans, trans like, are you cutting across the sectors as trans and are you cutting across the disciplines and cutting across the generations? And it's, is it collaborative um, for, uh, in service to others? So there's an essence, I think, to this, this um, sharing nature of transpreneurship. And so those who are interested in sort of evolving the concept or learning more, happy to be in touch. I think it's emergent by necessity. It just so happens that I've had the privilege of working in .gov, .com, .org, like in .edu. So those sectors and being entrepreneurial in each of them is something that's in my training. So it, it sort of started to come together. The last slide, I think, of the one that was sent out, you see the word strategy, compass, 
That's another way of looking at strategy is the art of creating power. We need to create many strategies, not like hackneyed term strategy, strategic goal, plan, objective. Like, you no, know, strategy is art and science, and it's beautiful and it's creative, and we need, and it's in a time of uncertainty and conflict, i.e., now and every day in the world, complexities. So, strategy, I think, is a very important word that as teachers in whatever schools, business schools, or others, needs to be resurrected to, to its authentic self of what it is and what is needed now. That's one thing. And you'll see implied elementally is the .com, .org, .edu, and like fire, air, earth, and water. These are almost like, you know, you could say they're personality elements. You'll have a dominant, almost like a Myers-Briggs, you'll have a dominant flavor of where you work and where you do your transpreneurship from. It might be the air element, .edu. So just knowing thyself as a leader, Working from there, it doesn't mean you have to suddenly switch careers, although you may want to, you may have suppressed your true calling. So in having the students understand their values based, doing some exercises on who you are, that will go through their whole life. That's the river that runs through it. Your three, your inner superpowers, your capabilities, those values that are who you are deep down. Teaching these kids who are so confused and anxious to like find their moral, like their value center, and whether they work at Starbucks or the State Department, they bring that with them. Those are their superpowers. And then two, not be afraid of your vocation. Where do you burn? Okay, what, what are you reading? What makes you angry? What, but finding their core values and their burn point. This is, and then moving on. So we want, like, and then, you know, reminding them to breathe while they're trying to get to the next, you know, law school or the next, you know, good job, or there's a lot of pressure from their parents and now they have huge student loans. These, this, the rising generation that's young, just graduating, is under enormous pressure, and the mental health capacities of our universities and our communities are simply not there to handle what I would call, like COVID, an invisible tsunami of psychosocial trauma. We are not in shape for that. We're focused on the physical and health and the economics and the dollar, the money, and this other invisible thing is running along and through all of society. So what do we do? Unless we teach everyone be a breather, be a burner, and be a doer. Being, seeing, doing, and aligned mind, body, spirit. All of this is ancient and as old as days. We forgot how to be well-rounded or whole people. More than a brain, more than a heart and feelings, and more than a body. So let's get back to like basics, I guess. So it sounds I'm like a little preachy, because I'm like, no, like this is urgency. But then don't do it as urgent, don't be so... Don't be so rushed, Jerry. Hurry slowly in the equipping of leaders. Nice. I know we've got about a minute, a minute and a half or so to wrap up. Um, Jerry, would you like to add any, anything? And this conversation has already been so rich. I'm not sure what else to add. I guess re-ask yourselves. I mean, it's more my question back to you. And I think it was one I just saw flip by. Like, what's burning again? Like, remember, we got so old. I mean, I got so old, I should say, that I forgot. And people are saying, like, well, what's your passion? Some of the vocabulary can be off-putting, but the question isn't. What do you love? Who do you love? Like, that's what do you burn for? Where's your sense? Getting back to that, like that a kid has it, is so open and honest about it, and we may have covered it up. If there's anything that comes out of this alone time, anything is asking that question again did i forget who i am and what i and whom i love and so that's my question to you like where find your burn Rem remember your core values just three don't not seven not a bunch of un principles who are you the three more like love compassion and what rediscover yourself your burn, and then when things start loosening up, we'll, re we'll resume doing. There's plenty of time for us to get busy again. We'll be doing a lot. But as you do, you'll be rooted in your being and your seeing of what is needed and who you are. And then that, then your serotonin, like, I don't know, you could be living with like no eyes and no limbs. You'll be fine. Thank you. I think this is exactly the inspiration we all are craving. Thank you very, thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Exactly all. One o'clock on, on the East Coast, East Coast, Coast of the United, United States. States. We wish everyone a health and well-being, well -being safety. safety. Um, um, many thanks many to you, thanks Jerry. To you, thank Jerry. you so thank much you for joining us.